It is just a huge, huge honor to be sitting in the studio with Andrew Sap- you say it. Sarpadar. So, Sop- Sarpadar. It'll take a few times. Sarpadar. I my my um, Spanish teacher uh, uh, Martin San Martin told my mom in uh, high school that I was linguistically challenged, <laughs> and my piano teacher um, um, fired me as a student. And Jenny Sun, and I can say Jenny Sun because yeah. that's not your real name. You 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 made up a name like that mm-hmm. for us Americans who can't say 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 your real name. Uh, Yi Jie. Sun. Okay, <laughs> I'm just gonna agree with that. These guys um, are legends. Uh, Andrew is a board certified orthodontist in private practice with his wife Jenny in the Greater Phoenix area. He attended dental school at UCLA before earning his master's degree in orthodontics from Columbia University in 2013. He's the co-founder of the Orthodontics Pearls Facebook group along with its corresponding annual meeting, the Mother of Pearls Conference, and is a strong advocate for collegiality and shared learning within the profession. In his free time, he enjoys traveling the world with his wife, working out, and spending time with his twin Puggles. Puggles. Chief and Lexi. That's right. Is that after the Kansas City Chiefs? (laughs) No, actually, uh, he was, so I was chief resident at um, Columbia uh, Ortho Program, and um, I had some friends in the dental school who got in the habit of calling me Chief, somewhat ironically, you know. And uh, we always joked about it. When we met, I made her call me Chief for a while, or at least I tried. <laughs> um, but then I said, you know, if, if, if it's not going to stick for me, we should at least name our dog Chief. So that's the long story of where that comes from. So Dr. Jenny Soon is an orthodontist in private practice with her husband, Andrew. Uh, Dr. Soon, Soon mm-hmm. was born in Beijing, China, but moved to Gilbert, Arizona at 13 years old, where she lived throughout her tenure at Arizona State University. Yay. That's where I the went. Sun uh, the Sun Devils. Upon graduation, she attended Columbia University in New York City, where she took an interest in orthodontics. Is that where you guys met? That's right. Yeah, he and- was in residency. I was in dental school. After receiving her DDS, she moved on to Tufts University to complete her specialty training in orthodontics. Today, she lives in Peoria, Arizona with her husbands and puggles. In her spare time, she enjoys traveling, drawing, and watching The Bachelor. (laughs) She is one year into her startup practice that she manages with her husband. And uh, they met in 2012, both with a passion in orthodontics. They wish one day to build a family in Arizona and a career transforming the smiles of young kids and adults. Their mission is to help people feel more confident and empowered. Icon Orthodontics was born in 2014 with their vision to provide excellent clinical care, outstanding customer service, and a nurturing environment for their patients and their team members. So I think everybody uh, wants to know the most obvious, who got a better orthodontic training program with uh, Dr. Jane <laughs> Chen in Columbia or Dr. Carol Ann Trotman in, uh, at Tufts? I'm not touching this one. I feel like that's a constant <laughs> debate in our household. <laughs> Do you guys sit there and say, well, Dr. Jing said this. And the other says, well, Carol said this. Yeah. Do you get that a lot? Well, uh, luckily, most of our diagnosis and treatment plan have been fairly similar. Um, and uh, when he and I talk about our training, we we always jokingly put each other down and say that uh, Tufts is better. He would always say Columbia is better. So Columbia is in New York City and Tufts in Boston. That That's the two coolest cities. I mean, I think mm-hmm. Boston's the coolest city. I mean, I remember one time lecturing up there and I was walking into a restaurant and you realize the street's higher than the door because oh, yeah. the door is made in the 1600s yeah. and all the meteorites and dust falling into the earth. Now the street is three, four feet higher than when the door. So you get to see how the earth is growing. But when you walk into a restaurant where the door says built in 1640, yeah. you're like, wow, for America, that's, that's, uh, I mean, this, this town. So, um, so uh, I, I call it dentistry and sensory because I don't like to talk about anything that everybody agrees on. I like to go right for the heart, but you can pass on any question. <laughs> um, it seems like of the 10 specialties, Orthodontics um, with the uh, this recent IPO on Wall Street, right. Smiles Drug Club. I mean, nothing like that's ever happened in pediatric dentistry or endo. Sure. Uh, so what what's happening to your specialty, and then what 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 do, what do you make of all this? Well, I think that's something that has been on all of our minds since 2013 when uh, this said company first made its debut. Um, it's there's been a lot of controversy throughout the dental profession. I think. Um, I think that our knee-jerk reactions have been some of, I mean, I think some people see it almost as a form of 
disrespect or slighting the education that we've got to see like everything that we've done is now packaged into this at home aligner kit. I mean, it's actually insulting on an emotional level for a lot of people. But once we get over that, um, I think we just need to look at what this is showing us about the industry, showing us about the demand for our services. And I think the ones who are going to thrive in whatever new environment comes our way are the ones who are going to recognize what is this telling us? You know, there's clearly a demand for something that we haven't been offering in the past, um, whether that be convenience, whether that be lower prices, um, whether that's just clear liners in general. Um, I think there's many ways to sort of surf this wave and it's going to be up to us to figure out where we fit in with that. I do think that one of the mistakes that a lot of people do is trying to compete head to head with this new thing. Um, I see it as a, a bit short sighted, probably a little bit lack of understanding of the economics behind it. Um, for example, I mean, this is a company who, to my knowledge, I don't believe they've turned a profit yet. I believe they're still hemorrhaging money uh, in the tens of millions of dollars every year. And I think I've seen copycats crop up. You've seen this in Phoenix. You know, we've seen the uh, the mall kiosks and we've seen certain businesses try to go direct to consumer, eliminate or greatly reduce the doctor's influence there. And as we watch these things, most of them are closing down at this point. And we've seen this happen. I'm sure you've, you've seen those in the malls. Even uh, I think there might have been one in the Chandler Mall, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. Um, so I think that if we can get past the emotional aspect of this thing, there is opportunity in, in what this is making us aware of, as well as the awareness that it's bringing to the public about what we do. I mean, we have such low market penetration right now, and I think a lot of that comes down to us failing as an industry to effectively market our services. Now that, in a sense, it's almost like these companies are doing the work for us, and as you've seen what's happened to their IPO, this is not, it's my prediction, this is not going to last as it has to this point. I'm sure it's going to evolve, it's going to change, and they'll find some way around the new regulations that are going to be coming out. But it's not its not going away entirely. And uh, I think that there's opportunity for those of us who are willing and able to take advantage of that to ride this wave that's coming. Okay, that was the Columbia take on everything. Now let's go <laughs> over to Tufts. Do you agree with Columbia? Does Um, Boston weigh in with New York? I I definitely agree with everything that Andy had said. Um, I feel like the thing is we cannot – Smile Direct Club has said that they are a dental service organization. They're not doctors. They're providing uh, the accounting, maybe the insurance billing, the the marketing. They're a DSO. So – but we need to get down to where – the doctors who are actually doing these clin checks, they're, I think they're getting paid fifty dollars a click to approve these clin checks, and uh, most of them actually the clin checks I've heard that they they get approved. It doesn't. I, I would assume that not everybody is class one mild crowding or spacing. But the ones that get approved, I've seen people like through the, the office where they had severe, severe crowding, severe bite issues, and they've also been approved. They've also gone through SDC. And uh, in those cases, I mean, it's the doctors who approve those that are, you know, under their legal and ethical obligation to not serve these patients with the at-home aligners. You know, I, I find it interesting because, you know, when I got out of school in 87, and please don't tell me neither of you were born at that time, were you? Before I was that, four. Before you were that. four? I was four, oh, yeah. Right, there right, we right, go. Right. Were you alive? I was alive? two. <laughs> were two? Okay, okay. So I'm not that old. Um, but, um, you know, the big brands of Colgate, Crest, Listerine, they, they all already existed. The only brand I've seen that big in my lifetime out of nowhere was Invisalign. Mm-hmm. I mean, you if you walk into a restaurant in Cambodia, the minute they find out you're a dentist, they're like, oh, do you know, they start asking about Invisalign. I sure. mean, I've... My, my boys, I mean, they, they um, just because they're sitting there with me, I remember in Ryan in uh, Somalia, they were uh, asking Ryan about Invisalign as if, you know, because he was with me and I was at, I mean, it's a huge brand. So it goes, uh, when, you, when you look at over the world, um, dentistry last year in the United States was, you know, there's 211,000 Americans alive with a license to practice dentistry and they build out 109 billion. There's 2 million dentists around the world. And last year they did half a trillion. And when you look out at dentistry, everything's just 
creeping along one and a half, two and a half percent growth for cleanings, fillings, exam. The only double digit growth is implants and clear aligners. Mm -hmm. Those are clearly the hottest thing at any meeting. I mean, if you're going to have a big dental meeting, you want to have someone showing you how to place implants and someone doing clear aligners because seven and a half billion people want to look um, better because the number one goal of a species is to reproduce, have offspring. You're not going to do that missing your front tooth, um, you know, and they just want to look more beautiful. So, um, but I do see how the main difference I see is Invisalign tried to come forward with a business model that incorporated you two. Mm -hmm. And Smiles Direct Club said, I don't need you two. <laughs> and that was, and that's why one is growing rapidly and one is contracting to what I think will be uh, eventually a fatality. Well, I, I would tend to agree with that. I mean, fatality, I'm not sure. I mean, we've seen their stock plummet ever since the IPO. I mean, it dropped, what, like 20%, 30% the first day? Yeah. Um, enough so that they opened up a, a class action suit on behalf of the investors um, for, uh, for fraud. And we see this in, you, you just look at the, at the breadcrumbs. I mean, um, I'm not an expert on this, but I, from the articles I've read, I understand one of the uh, founding members was selling his plane to the, to the company for $750 million. I mean, they're under strict laws that prevent them from cashing out, but it seems like they're making every, or they did make every effort to cash out within the bounds of legality and possibly even outside of those bounds. We'll find that out soon enough. Um, so it's, it seems to me like they, they have to know on some level that there's, that they're advertising essentially a technology that does not exist yet. And whether that's possible in the future remains to be seen. But I keep coming back to the, the Theranos example, the Theranos analogy. Are you familiar with Theranos? Have you seen that? Uh, yeah, that, that woman, there is, the, the, the blood Elizabeth, test. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, Elizabeth Holm. Um, this became really well known when uh, HBO made the documentary. I think it's called the, uh, the Inventor or the Founder or something like that. Uh, I, can't, I can never recall the exact name. But – it's interesting to see how one of her uh, idols was um, was uh, was it Bell? I'm trying to remember now. It wasn't Bell. Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison. Mm -hmm. uh, and his model was just keep the funding going, and even if you don't have a product. Convince people that you do, and get that funding coming in, and eventually you figure it out. And the story of his, uh, I think it was telephone or light bulb. I'm horrible with these with these details. You'll have to excuse me. One of those inventions, uh, a telephone light bulb, it was down to the wire as the story goes. And it was the night before he was basically had to cash out. And that's the day that he, that he figured it out. And then now he's a hero by American standards. And I think Elizabeth Holm was going down that route. She knew she didn't have a viable product. She knew that this was a technology that everyone said was impossible, which is the same thing they would say about the light bulb. And she just kept going in spite of that. And eventually she just, she never quite tipped. I, you know, one speculation of mine is perhaps that's what's going on with, uh, with smile direct is that maybe they think if we can get this funding going, if we can get the funding based on the idea of something that sounds amazing, I mean, it, it almost sounds too good to be true. And we're kind of finding out that it probably is, then they can make it happen. If they get that funding in, get the research going, maybe AI saves them, who knows. Um, but as we're seeing the, the check is coming due and I don't think they have anything. Well, the neat thing about Edison and um, and what later would be GE and and versus Westinghouse is the winners always had a flair for marketing. I mean, mm -hmm. when he came, when they were working electricity, the first thing he did is the electric chair. Mm -hmm. He knew everybody would show up to see that. <laughs> and then he did the uh, World's Fair. I think that year it was in Chicago. If you and, say so. And uh, you know, at nighttime the whole city's dark, so he lit up that whole Chicago Fair, the World Fair but they all had a massive flair for marketing. But by the way, that Smiles Drug Club, did you see that podcast I did with the uh, that attorney, Rick Stone? Um, I missed that one. Yeah, I'll so, have to check that out. So Rick Stone, lawyer on lawsuits against Smiles Drug Club, this is the guy that, that this is the guy that's going to take them down. And and I knew he wouldn't come on the show because he's a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And and as I knew, but I, you know, I had to contact him and ask anyway. And he immediately said, absolutely. And I thought, well, why would he do that? Well, why do how do you see all these salvage commercials? Have you been injured by, you know, um, multiple myeloma? You know, call the law firm, and he just wanted leads. So, we, we I interviewed him, and just on YouTube, it had five hundred eighty five views. But 
if, if you um, you should push this around with orthodontics because what he's telling me is he says I need injured patients and most of these orthodontists I've seen one guy that had gum disease somebody who got their fifty dollars for a claim check mm -hmm. but would not have been approved by anybody who sat right. down and um, he's just, I mean, look look at him sweating that deal look look at him like that. <laughs> can you see that <laughs> yeah. look, look at this I mean this guy. He, he, he was burning the midnight hours. This was uh, this was a crazy deal, but yeah, it, it, it's going to be a big fight. And where the, where they're going to get in trouble is that fifty dollar claim check, where somebody clearly should not have this you know treatment, right? And they're getting it. So you should push that around with more. Well, if you, if you want to if you want to um, kick you know dirt in the uh, or make their problem worse, then more orthodontists should contact. Well, actually, them. there's. Um there actually, this actually has been a big push in the orthodontic community. Now, as you know, um, I'm co-admin on a, uh, a Facebook group for orthodontists. It's uh, 5,500 and counting. Um, Mothers of Pearl. Mother of Pearl. Uh, that's the conference. That's the name of the conference. The actual Facebook group is called Orthodontic Pearls. Orthodontic Pearls. And and, one, uh, and, we're, we're in, what, what's the deal with Pearls? You have to explain Mother of Pearls is Facebook. Right. What, what's so the group on it, Facebook if they want to go there? It's called Orthodontic Pearls. Facebook.com. Or, uh, orthodontic pearls orthodontic pearls and did you know um did you know the um founder of um facebook did you know his dad's a dentist i did know that yes. uh, Ed, Ed yeah Ed comes on the show once a year to tell everybody what to do on facebook and i am um we email a lot and um um yeah, Ed, Ed helps me so much. So Facebook group, Orthodontic Pearls, and then your conference is Mother of Pearls. Mother of Pearls. So explain the pearl connection. What does that mean, just white pearly teeth? So uh, Orthodontic Pearls, it was it was founded as a, a group to share your pearls, you know, just basically okay. your little your little ideas of how to treat cases better or like, you know, tie in this way and you get this much rotation or, you know, here, use this sort of intrusion arch for uh, for this type of occlusion. Um, since then it's kind of grown. We just, we let it evolve and it definitely has gone into more of a business focus, um, in certain aspects. Uh, a lot of it actually has to do with social aspects as well. I mean, one of the things that we recognize most practitioners suffer through is this sense of loneliness being on our own Island here. Um, anyone who's graduated and tried to start up a practice can certainly understand that. And in, uh, in a huge way, this, alleviates some of that loneliness it helps to have multiple people across the country across the world really that you can commiserate with and talk about your your universal struggles um and just recognize that what we're going through is not anything unique it feels that way in the beginning but for every problem there's someone else who has been through it and who has come out victorious on the other end and this is a way of connecting us to all of those people it's uh, really been a, an amazing experience and, and you know it's it's really weird because uh, like two dentists across the street are thinking, ah, oh, I'm competing with you. I'm you know, ah, oh, stay away, you know. And but if you're on the other side of the country, then they they open up. And and I remember when I got out of um, dental school, I opened up, uh, got out May 11, went straight to Awatuki, was open by September 21, 87, just one month in time for the um, the um, Black Monday where the stock market collapsed a quarter. Uh, Ouch. <laughs> <clears throat> and the phone didn't ring one one ring for like three days, but when I, I did that, you know, you just left you know 120 classmates, so you just left this drunken alcoholic, <laughs> you know, party, and so I'm banging on all the doors, and half of them are like, oh, you shouldn't have been here. We don't need another dentist, and right. they were they they like I like I was a, a germ or a bug, right? And the other half were like, come on in, and you know, we chargle a burger, had a beer. Now, 32 years later. Guess which ones I think had a much more fun, exciting, rewarding career. I mean, mm -hmm. when when I go out of town and I roll it over to emergencies, I mean, they don't want to drive to Glendale. Right. I I, I tell them to call Tom Mattern across the street, down by Jungle Roots. You know, um, mm -hmm. down there. It's like it's like th these are your buddies, and yes. and I mean, for thirty years, I I'm, I'm so many times someone come in and they're like, oh, I'm going to sue that guy because of this. And this. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll just fix it for free. If you knock off this lawsuit, so he's a great guy. He's a great man, great family. It didn't turn out. I'll fix it for free, but you got to knock off that deal because I'm sure if I went in your life, you made mistakes too. But you know, it's just. But so they they they're always still friends with their four buddies from dental school, mm -hmm. 
but they they don't become that four friends with the guy across the street. So I want you to talk about that because that's what you're doing outstandingly is trying to get orthodontists to be colleagues and colloquial and come on, we're on the same team. You know what I like the most about the Smiles Direct Club? You know what I like about that? When Invisalign came out, the, the first orthodontic reaction I felt was that, well, you general dentists better not, you know, we were the bad guys that we were trying to do Invisalign. Right. Now with Smiles Direct Club, now, now we're their friend. Yep, exactly. So your your enemy's enemy is your friend. So yep. now the orthodontists are like, you know, I kind of like General Dentist because that Smiles Direct is so bad mm-hmm. that now the General Dentist is not my enemy. And um, and it's like we've been on the same team the whole time. And I almost think it took a Smiles Direct Club to get everybody on the same on the same team. There's there's so much to unpack there. But just to, to address your first uh, statement there of uniting the – we'll start with the orthodontic profession – um, this has always been one of our goals. And, uh, like you said, smile direct club, it's presenting sort of a common enemy. I, it's, I don't know of an, or, well, okay. I'm not, I'm not going to say that, but I, there's, you would have to search few and far between to find an orthodontist or a dentist who actually supports what they're, what they're doing. And in the face of that common enemy, we do find a lot of common ground, even within the orthodontic profession, we are so fragmented and, Never has that been more clear than, than running a Facebook group um, because most of the Facebook groups out there, they do have a very specific uh, agenda. Um, either this one is, you know, about pushing Invisalign or this one's about, you know, very, uh, you know, financing a certain way or whatever it is. It, no matter your niche, you're going to find a Facebook group for it. Orthodontic Pearls, we really are trying to remain neutral in all of this because we see it as... It's, it, it, we want it to be an organic animal. It should evolve with the profession, and we don't. that doesn't happen if we're shutting one voice out here or there. So we really founded ourselves on the idea of protecting the conversation, you know, keeping things from getting personal. You don't want to have any sort of derogatory language, sarcasm, anything that really shuts down communication. And then let's just have at it. You know, similar to what you're doing with this podcast, let's get into these controversial issues, but discuss it like adults and come out with, hopefully, a richer understanding all the way around. That requires an open mind. It requires a level of professionalism that it may not be for everyone. But I think that that's, I, I do see the effect that that's had um, in my own life as well as the those who are members of the forum. So when we started Dental Town, so I started Dental Town five years before Facebook mm-hmm. because I was too stupid to think of the uh, 2,000 patients for every dentist. I was just being a dentist thinking of dentists. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and um, it, w- it was very hard before emojis because mm-hmm. when you're, talking to someone you have you know a hundred million years of evolution with all these smiles and muscles and you know they the non-verbal cues of being relaxed and non-threatened and non-aggressive and i remember when dental town started in 99 there were no emojis so you know you would say something that was the funniest joke in the world but you thought i was dead serious <laughs> of and course and then your reply was profanity and well and <laughs> right. so so they invented LOL before they invented an emoji. Yes. And um, when you're um, talking face to face, and, and I and I have the, a lot of problem even running a company. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll see a thread going, and finally I intervene and say, come on, you guys are eight feet from each other. Get off the email. Mm-hmm. Someone walk over there, because clearly you, you don't understand what the other person's saying. Um, but it's come a long way. Um, you, you, you said something in the beginning, and I can't quit thinking about it. You said that the orthodontic, you talked about the orthodontic market penetration was low. Oh, right. Um, what, 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 a, what figure or number, what, what are you thinking when you think that? I'm, I'm not much of a numbers guy, Howard, but, um, I do know that I, I believe that I may be misquoting myself on here. Uh, we're at like one to 3% market yeah. penetration, something like that into the, a uh, number of potential patients who are actually undergoing orthodontic treatment. And, and the best place to read about that was in the Smiles Drug Club when, in the IPO. And that's what I tell people. If the fastest way to learn economics is own one share of every publicly traded dental company, like like uh, Danaher just spun off Invista. Well, they, they have to, by SEC, send you a 10 quarterly report and then a 10K annual report. And if they lie, they go to jail. And um, you can do that with Patterson and Shine and all these companies. And I love it because they're writing to the Wall Street people who are the most analytical. Mm-hmm. And I love reading their 10 Qs. And so many uh, dentists, they'll, they'll be saying something. And I'm like, well, that's just not true because 
if this guy's that that company, if if that's a lie, they're going to go to jail for five years. Mm -hmm. They're they're not lying on a ten k annual report. But yeah, the the orthodontic market. So so when I was little, um, I grew up in. Uh, I was born in sixty two. It was just the most messed up child would get ortho, mm -hmm. and everybody was about five and a half kids per family. Right. And then with with birth control technology, as the families <laughs> got down to two, now I've seen it switch to it's an entitlement. I mean, right. you got two kids though. I, I mean, I see people getting braced on like, well, what's wrong? Well, that teeth a little bit. In, in the sixties, you got braces cause you couldn't eat corn on the cob to a chain link fence. <laughs> you know, it was like, it was like, okay, no one's going to reproduce with this person. It'll have to be a nun or a priest. Right. If you want this kid to ever make you a grandchild, you're going to have to fix them up to, before you put them on the market. So, and, and now it seems like you see the big orthodontic push in grammar school. And then you see it again after the first divorce. They're going back on the market, <laughs> right. and they need they need fixed up and touched up. And then um, and then you know a second marriage is just it's the triumph of op optimism over experience. And then uh, they'll get it a third time. Right. When, <laughs> so right. when, um, when they don't wear the retainers and it all goes back. Right. So so in trying to get these dentists, you got this big group. You said there's fifty five hundred people on Facebook.com Orthodontic Pearls. Correct. How, how do you, um, what is your goal? I mean, it, it, let me back up. Um, you know, everybody wants to be more successful. What, um, I'm sure you're, at the end of the day, your goal is you want these orthodontists to be more successful. Of course. What, what is your definition of success? What, what are you trying to achieve on? So that's, that's a really good question. Now, if you're asking us, what are we trying to achieve on the forum itself? What is our definition of success? Um, we, I mean, I think that evolves over time. You have to be con continually moving your goalpost. In the beginning, our original goal was we just want to grow as fast as possible, which most startups would would resonate with that. So you know we were just we were recruiting people, um, we were getting the uh, the biggest names that, that captured an audience, you know, to post on there and really uh, drive our um, our influence. Um, and as we as we started to grow, like I said, we want this to be an organic thing. We're not trying to necessarily influence one way or another because. We're, it's all founded by people like me. You know, we're about five to 10 years out in practice. Um, we're still learning and I'm, I firmly believe in continual learning. I don't believe that the opinions I have today are going to be the ones I have five years, 10 years from now. Um, I certainly hope they're not the same. And I recognized that for me, the growth is what's important. And I wanted to create a forum. We wanted to create a forum that is conducive to that growth, to that change. So really our goal is for, first of all, to sort of lighten the, the communication a little bit, open, facilitate that communication. Because what we notice is that there's just, there's such tribalism, even within specialties right now. Um, and I don't think that's ever going to go away. That's just a part of human nature. But if we can do something to sort of at least break down that wall in some way and open communication and influence someone in a positive way, that's really our, our current goal for this. Um, I, I think that I don't know where I would be today if I hadn't found the, the online forums to discuss these sorts of things. And I want to protect that for, for others. Well, you know, they all know it. They just don't think about it. I mean, they've been told since they're just told, it's not what you know, it's what you know and who you know. Get out there and network. You know, you know when I opened up my dental office, you know, back then we... we you, you didn't have Facebook and, you know, all these things like that. But I opened up my dental office, and uh, it was Monday through Friday, 7 to 7. Mm -hmm. And then Saturday morning, I got up, and I got a big map of Ahwatukee. And uh, back then, it was Ahwatukee. It wasn't Phoenix, Arizona, It got and it got annexed. But um, I went door to door. It took me half a year to walk down every street. When I walked down the street, I'd take a magic marker. I had this big old map in the back of my car. And I would knock on the door and say, hey, I was 24. I said, hey, I'm Howard, and I just opened up my dental office there, and I said, I'm going to be there till, till I'm 65, and, and um, I just wanted to get out and meet the neighborhood, and if you need a dentist, I'm right there. And about two out of three people would think, okay, you're a dentist. <laughs> and two out of three people are like, this is just weird. Yeah. And I thought, well, there's eight other dentists on the corner. They go back there. Mm -hmm. 
And the third guy would be out there in his, you know, wife beater shirt and his underwear saying, oh, I get it, I get this shit. And then I put down my backpack and I pull out my, my mirror and a flashlight and, and we talk about it. And then I, then I pull out my deal and I said, well, I have an opening um, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, till the end of time. Does any of those hours work for you? And I wouldn't quit on Sunday until my next Monday through Friday, every hour and a half, I had a patient. But I got every one of them door to door. And now here it is 32 years later. And I mean, last week in the office, someone said, I can remember when you came to my door back in 1987. And um, there, I mean, I... I still have patients. I'm, I mean, Mary Jo uh, is one of my um, patients, and uh, um, and she has passed away. But she every time she came in, she had to laugh and said, "I can remember when you had hair and were knocking <laughs> on my door." And so it's just like you just get out there and, and press the flush. They're just they're just humans. They want a relationship. And the problem with dentistry is that when I t- my my favorite business that I try to um, reflect on the most is um, Grulix Automotive across the street. Love Grulix. That's where we take our cars. You know, which yeah. is the, oh, okay. oh, actually, in we're, we live in Peoria, but because, the one out there. Because I grew up with five sisters. I played Barbie dolls till I was 12. <laughs> so when I go to the mechanic and he says, you know, you're, you know, it's not your battery, it's your alternator, it's your lifters. I, I don't know what a lifter is. I've never changed mm-hmm. oil in a car. So I'm looking at him and I'm trying to say, do I trust this guy? Remember in um, uh, Peanuts cartoons, whenever the adults talked, it was wah, 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 wah. <laughs> and when you start telling someone about, you know, their class two overbite, and then they, they're, all they hear is wah, 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 wah. They, <laughs> and, and you're just like, do I trust this guy? Mm-hmm. And um, and when I tell you you have four, an MO, a DO, and an MOD, I mean, right. what are you supposed to bounce that off your, right. um, wh- where, where, what? lecture did you miss in high school to not know <laughs> so at the end of the day it's just like is do i trust him or not exactly and um it, it's a game of trust i i completely agree with that and I, I believe that um we're i mean we're in the teeth business but most importantly we're in the people business and i think that that uh that has to do with our patients of course it has to do with our our team of doctors that we choose to work with um really every aspect even, even your your landlord you know uh, and one of the advantages that the networking has provided me is the opportunity to visit some of the guys who I consider monumental successes and see how they do things. And there's a lot to be said for actually visiting and observing. Um, you, you talk to someone online, they might give you their reasons for why they think they're successful, but half the time they don't even really understand it themselves and they don't know your area or they've only practiced in this one very specific niche, but getting out there and observing it from uh, from a third person perspective, you can pick up on these things and really identify what is it that will work in my area, what is it that I want to test in my area, and uh, maybe even come up with a new hypothesis for what is making this person successful. So, you know, with um, by observing these people, you start to pick up on very subtle cues, and a lot of this has to do with emotional intelligence. Um, the more I read, the more I recognize these are principles that have been written about before, um, you know, how to win friends and influence people, all this stuff. It's nothing really new, but we're so, many of us are so used to being very technical about the details. And that's how we've gotten to this point. We're always focused on, you know, a, a, this millimeter or so off in the, in the tooth or the prep or whatever you're, you're doing there, that we tend to discount those, those people skills. And then once we graduate, uh, the smart ones figure out pretty quickly that, well, from here on out, you have the skills already to overserve your patients in terms of what they need with dentistry. You can choose to use those or not, but really what's going to get you ahead at this point is, like you said before, you know, how are you marketing those amazing skills? How, how did Edison market that electricity? Um, that's the part that makes someone who's technically very good monumentally successful. And unfortunately, we also see that it makes some people who are not that great, you know, they, they find success too. But uh, the principle there is you have to you have to understand and you have to embrace the fact that this is all about people and trust. Yeah, I mean, dental school, pretty much all we learned are the technical things. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't learn t- that much about business. We didn't really learn about um, how to run a business, how to uh, successfully be a good boss, how right. to manage staff. There are just so many things that are um, kind of running my lives right now, but uh, very little is about ortho. Yes. Um, 
And later on, I mean, being out of school, uh, out of residency for four years now, I do feel like it's to patients, it's not really about what you tell them. It's about how you made them feel. Right. Uh, they won't remember, I would say, 95% of the things I tell them. But they will remember if um, they felt welcomed in the office, if uh, everybody smiled at them, remembered their names, um, if they felt special. So right. um, I feel like that's one thing for private practice to be very successful at. Even DSOs, uh, you know, those dental corporations, their turnover rate is so high, mm -hmm. they're not going to be able to provide that kind of service. And I'm hoping that's going to be what you know keeps private practice in um, for a long period of time. Right. I think it's so funny how people are so afraid of the DSOs. My God, I mean, the DSOs, I mean, they're going to come in there and say, well, I went in there and she said I had 10 cavities. Mm -hmm. So I went in there to do the first two. She didn't even work there anymore. <laughs> and, and it's like, okay, so they can't even, you're afraid of that. You know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid of the guy across the street that's had the same two hygienists for 25 years mm -hmm. and people recognize them at Safeway yeah. and Fry's. I mean, it, it's the relationships. Um, I want to, I want to um, ask you a question, um, uh, a totally different question. Um, so when I got my MBA at ASU and, um, and if you get a degree at ASU, you can really say U of A because if you just go to Tucson drive by U of A with your windows down, they'll throw a diploma <laughs> in your back seat. So I, I should say ASU and, and U of A. Um, but they, um, you know, the only business model of retail has been um, one stop shop bigger for 200 years. So you go back to Manhattan in the 1800s and you had the little, you know, shop and maybe a hundred square feet. And then they were put out of business because the next generation rented two shops and had twice those. And it just kept going, going, going till they all maxed out at about 250,000 square feet for Walmart, Ikea, Costco, all, all the big ones. And then they realized Walmart released that study saying they got too big. People were now saying it's too big. I don't want to hassle that. So they, they backed down. But 250,000 is the max. Um, you see that, you know, you take your kid to a pediatric dentist. The first thing mom's going to say is, do you think he's going to need braces? And her answer is, oh, well, here's a slip. I want you to get back in your car and drive down the road. Like when I started lecturing in Australia in 1990, they didn't have a grocery store that sold meat, bread, vegetables. So back in Australia in 1990, you'd go to the, the butcher mm -hmm. and then you'd go to the bread guy. And it's like, where's the grocery store? And it wasn't there yet. Now it's right. there. But now it seems like um, the fastest growing business model is to combine pedo and ortho. Um, do you think that, do, do you agree or disagree? Or is, is that a more successful retail business model than having to go to the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker? Yeah, so um, I actually do associate for a pedo ortho office. Um, I'm the only orthodontist there, and they have uh, three to four pediatric dentists. It definitely makes the lives of our patients a lot easier, patients' parents. They don't have to pick one up, untie the wire, drop them off, uh, get the cleaning, and take them back up, back to the orthodontist, put the wire in, and then they're done for that visit. Uh, with the, at the pediatric dental dental office I work out of, um, I think that's a very very um, main component of why they pick up pick us is because of the convenience. Um, however, you know because it's um, one pedo office, one orthodontist, so I'm not there every day, so that can you know, cause some issues because with emergencies like bracket breaks, um, uh, appliance falls off, I'm not there all the time. Um, so if we can have a full-time pedo, full-time ortho, full-time oral surgery all in one building, that would be ideal for our patients where they can just, you know, walk across the hallway and get their other service done. Um, but with DSOs, yes, they advertise that they have, you know, five different specialties there, but one specialty is only there one day a week or one, two, two days a month. Mm -hmm. So that, peak, I mean, I've worked in a couple different uh, DSOs. Uh, Andy has worked in a couple different DSOs. Each office can only support an orthodontist, you know, four days a, a month. Right. So that. I think that's, that's something that's, uh, that's important there is that the, uh, the ratios of practitioners have to be just right. Mm -hmm. Um, I do see sometimes, I mean, we, we notice this in, uh, in corporate, you know, and like she said, I, I started out working for um, a few different corporations, which is pretty much what everyone does nowadays. And the, uh, what, you, what you gain in convenience of having it all under one roof, sometimes you do lose in the convenience of accessibility. Um, for example, there's offices that I work out of where they had maybe three, 
three GPs um, and then like a, a handful of specialists. And each of the specialists were there maybe two days a month. And um, for that demographic, it worked because we were the cheapest in town. And that works for people who are looking for cheap. But I don't think that the biggest pull there was convenience. Maybe in the sense that, you know, they're at the dentist and the dentist says, hey, get, get braces. And it, it removes that barrier of having to go to a different office, you know, because I happen to be there that day and we, we convert them. Um, but it's, I don't think that anyone has mastered this group practice model yet. Um, I've seen some, some come pretty close, but I would predict that in the future, we're going to see a lot more group practices. Um, I think that the strongest business model is getting the ratios of proportions of practitioners just right. Uh, but have everyone having some sort of skin in the game, because what we notice is that in a DSO or even in most associate positions, the doctor does tend to turn over very frequently. And as you mentioned, Howard, that can really lead to some dissatisfaction with the, uh, with the patients. It, it harms the continuity of care, especially in something like orthodontics, where it goes on 12, 18, 24 months sometimes. It's, if you're turning over your, your doctor every 6 to 12 months, you're very rarely finishing those cases with the same guy, oftentimes at least to increase treatment time, because what we do is as much an art as a science. And if someone isn't doing the art exactly the same way, usually those first few months when they're in that, that new office, they're undoing what the previous guy did and then redoing it the way they did. Or they just continue to retie. I've seen that too. And they're just sort of apathetic towards it. Um, I've definitely seen and inherited some cases from uh, doctors who were kind of biding their time waiting for the next thing to open up. Um, and I think until these challenges get addressed, that group practice model is always going to be sort of a second tier, um, second tier model. But I do believe it's the future for those who can master it. Well, I, I always thought it was fun that you learned something from um, every model. Like, like when you said, um, the first thing I thought is when you said, um, you know, I mean, how many, I, I do this all the time where they, they, they come into us and we, um, you know, you, you send them to orthodontist, they take everything off, then they come to us, they clean, and they go back. Well, there was an orthodontist, um, Benjamin um, Benjamin Burris, Benjamin Gray Burris, who was on the show, um, episode 439, and of course now he's actually um, indicted. Um, but one of the first things he got in trouble for is, is having hygienist. Right. And I, one of my little says, you know, Google says, first do no evil, and then all they do is evil. <laughs> and um, so the de dentists always tell me, I always say, well, are you patient focused? Or are you dentist focused? Oh, I'm totally dentist focused. What are your hours? Uh, Monday through Thursday, eight to five. Okay, the Federal Reserve has more um, PhD economists than any place on earth. I think like 3,200. And they've done a gazillion studies showing that one third of America can't go to the doctor Monday through Friday, eight to five. Mm -hmm. So what are your hours again? Uh, I, well, we, we got rid of Friday. We're just Monday through Thursday, eight to five. Well, you can't look at me with a straight face and say you're patient focused. Right. If 3,200 doctors said that one third of America can't go to you during those right. hours. Right. And, and so here is Ben Burris, who I, I always love because I, I know he's a rebel rouser. He's a hell rouser. I mean, I know when you, when you ever talk to an orthodontist about Ben Burris, you know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, of course. He's of course. one of the most controversial figures in anything yeah. in the dental community in general. <laughs> so I already want to go to Arkansas and drink with him. Um, just on, on that referral. He's alone. in Orlando now. Well, yeah, yeah when yeah. you start, when you get caught for bribing an Arkansas right. <laughs> senator, I'm sure yeah. his own lawyer said, can you get out of Arkansas for now? But, um, but the thing is, um, um, what, what did you, what, what did you just on that deal? What's wrong with an orthodontist having a hygienist? I mean, just to address that, because I've learned something for orthodontics from, um, back, um, when Gaspar Lazara did orthodontic centers of America. I, I think he, he, he was the only one that made it to the New York Stock Exchange, had a billion-dollar valuation. And he, he shot, taught me something that I never even thought about. Imagine going to get your nails done. Mm -hmm. And let's just say for easy math to get a mani-pedi was $100 a month. Uh, say you got it done every two weeks. Do you get it a mani-pedi or not really? Not really. Do you? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, <laughs> My, um, I do, but it's only, uh, when my gay brother, um, uh, you know, be, um, <laughs> wants to go get a Manny Petty and I, so I get a Manny Petty with my brother, Paul, they even, I, um, but anyway, um, 
So I do that, but let, let's say it was $50 to get a mani-pedi and you got it done twice a month. Say it's 100 a month. Well, if you walked in there and she said, well, you know how hard to get a mani-pedi? It's $100 a month. And uh, so for a two-year treatment, it'd be $2,400. I need 1000 down. And then we're going to finance you for the remaining 1400 if you approve a care credit. I'd be like, whoa, 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 what's going on? Well, that's what Gasper said about orthodontics. He came out and he said, he said look, I got a pano and a ceph. Mm -hmm. The rest is my time. Um, if I finance a $6,500 ortho case and I need a third down, am I going to prepay one third of my rent, mortgage, equipment, build out computer, insurance, staff, malpractice, st mm -hmm. nothing? So he came out and he said, look, Orthodontic Centers of America, $0 down, 0% financing. No one's denied $199 a month um, for two years. And all these Americans said, oh, my God, because I wanted to go to U2, mm -hmm. but it was 6500 I need 2000 down. Hell, there's dentists listening to this podcast that don't have $2,000. Right. And um, so, and, and then in economics at ASU, they said, well, if you got a big economic barrier to entry, demolish yes. it. So I thought, my gosh, now, um, you know, no one really talks about that business right. model, but they look at every furniture ad. Mm -hmm. No money down. Right. Nobody denied. And now you're going to, they're going to finance something, you know, for this share. But anyway, and then on Smiles Drug Club, the first thing I thought is, well, do you need to see them every month for 24 months? Because these guys are saying, we're going to see you one time. And, and instead of 24 months, we're going to get rid of 10. We're going to see you one time. Here's 14 trays. So my right. first thing is, well, maybe you could see them every other tray. Right. So, there, you know, there's, so you can't be orthodontic centers of America without, some something unique mm -hmm. you can't be smiles drug club without something unique so i always looked at these as opportunities about somebody tried something really big it failed orthodontic centers of america smiles drug club will fail and they, i'm sure they're they don't even know it yet uh, ben ben burris tried to have the eye just right. for a cleaning he failed but the, so do you ever look at these big emotional orthodontic earthquake disasters sure. would take away a pearl? Absolutely. And I, I think Ben Burris is a classic example of this. Ben was, uh, he was fairly prominent when I first graduated from my residency in uh, 2013. Um, I, I feel like I owe a lot of my thinking to, to Ben because he does have some, he's a brilliant guy, uh, brilliant businessman. Um, I, I, the, the financing that he advocated for that you referenced, I think that that really helped me and helped a lot of practices um, weather a storm, so to speak. Now, I will say one, one hole that I'd poke in the, uh, in the nail analogy, though, is that um, with, a, with a nail salon, you're, you get a procedure done. It's done that day. You can come back or not, but it's like the, the, the procedure's finished that day. With orthodontics, dentistry in general, um, you have to think about this is uh, you know, a one- to two-year process there. I think uh, the analogy that I like to use is more that of a contractor building a house or building a dental practice, um, Once, except that we actually do maintain liability over that patient's well-being. Uh, for example, one of the things that is tough about orthodontics is if a patient falls delinquent in their mid-treatment, and we say we extracted teeth on them, we're closing space, we don't have the option of just saying, well, you're done paying with us, we're not going to see you anymore. And that's something that maybe <laughs> not everyone knows, but you can't do harm. You can't leave a patient worse off than where they were. Okay, but so, I, a quarter of my viewers are still in dental kindergarten school, so sure. they might not uh, understand patient abandonment. So, okay. So explain to the kids in school. Okay. Uh, so uh, about the extractions? About, about patient you? abandonment. Patient well, abandonment. Because okay. the nail gotcha. salon lady can say, I know I'm never going to do your exactly, nails again. Exactly. Exactly. You got someone in the middle of treatment. You can't just say. Well, let's let's look at this from, you know, the perspective of, uh, of a dentist, you know, and a, and a crown prep. Um, I know that Sarek has rose to prominence recently, but um, in the in the old days, we had to do the crown prep. Sometimes that would take one or two uh, visits in itself. Um, you take the impression, send it out to the lab, takes a couple of weeks to get back, then you cement it. That procedure is not done until you cemented that final prep. Now, let's say that um, you decide to finance this because, hey, I, I'm starting the prep now. It's not really costing me anything but time and the cost of a, a burn and impression material. So, you know, I'll, I'll do you know, I'll do zero dollars down for this and I'll, I'll take the hit if it doesn't come back. Well, if that patient doesn't pay you by the time that you're ready to cement that crown, you, you have a dilemma on your hands. You know, do you cement the crown anyway and accept that, well, maybe this patient doesn't pay me later or do you abandon your patient and you leave them with uh, a, a hole in their mouth, a, a tooth that is now worse off than where it started? Um, ethically, legally, we're not able to do that as, as doctors. I, I hope maybe that provides a little more clarity. But again, it's, it's sort of like a contractor. If, if 
the, yes, there is, there is a time in which you can collect that money. And I'm a big advocate for patient financing. It's one of the things that we, that we base our practice on. But I think that it's important not to overlook that challenge of patient abandonment that can come with it. And also understand that you are inheriting some risk. You don't get that for free there. And there's been studies on this. I know Jamie Reynolds, who runs OrthoFi. Are you, are you familiar with OrthoFi? It's, OrthoFi, yes. It's, a, uh, it, it's basically a, a company that helps streamline the, the financing process. So the advantage is they, they've collected tons of data on this subject. And they found that, uh, for example, a patient, if they're going to fall delinquent- Jamie fall, Reynolds? Jamie Reynolds, yeah. He's uh, of Spillane and Reynolds Orthodontics out in uh, Detroit. Yep. And they found that if a patient is going to fall delinquent, they're usually going to fall delinquent within the first three months. Um, so patient abandonment aside, if you can identify that um, and perhaps avoid extracting or avoid doing something that's going to leave that patient worse off than, than where you started, you can kind of skirt around that issue while also it's sort of a, a soft internal credit monitoring, so to speak. Um, so I, I'm actually a huge advocate for that, but of course, patient abandonment makes the financing um, significantly more challenging. And I will say that I have had to render quote unquote free treatment to patients who I started with a, with an incredibly generous financing plan. Um, we extracted teeth on them early on and they didn't pay a single bill after that. And now I've bought that case and I'm doing it for free. Um, so I, you know, it's, there's, there's nuance to it. There's, uh, there's definitely some risk that you inherit. And I think that we should factor that into our financing decisions as well. And sorry, and I think with orthodontics, a lot of our, um, how our result turn out is how we diagnose treatment plan, how we place the brackets. So mm -hmm. a lot of what we've learned, our knowledge is invested in that first visit. Mm -hmm. And I've had patients where we place brackets, with generous financing, and then they, continue their treatment in Mexico. Right. Um, they drive down to Mexico now to do their adjustments because, you know, the brackets are ours, the wires are ours, the uh, uh, bracket placement is, which is, I think, one of the most important things in orthodontics, that's ours. But now they can continue their treatment elsewhere because they feel like it's, um, um, maybe they can't afford the monthly payments or maybe they're just taking advantage of the low down payment. Because uh, in Mexico, I think that you do like, um, Five hundred dollars to get it on, and like a hundred dollars every time you go back. Kind of like mm -hmm. what you were were saying, the nail salon comparison. Um, but I I feel like as orthodontists, we what we do a lot is the initial the treatment planning mm -hmm. and the bracket positioning, and and then uh, usually you know we see them back every six to eight weeks to um, tie the wire, change wires, and sometimes yeah we can stretch it out a little bit longer, but. Um, I would say, especially with like twin bra twin brackets, the old ties uh, wear out pretty pretty. Um, after they don't like, know what twin brackets are. Oh, the ones Your that traditional braces, the traditional braces that like has the a opposite color. of self ligating. Uh, See, when I was little, I asked for clear liners, yeah. but he said, "Dude, you're going to end up behind bars, so let's put your teeth behind bars for now <laughs> to start getting you used to living behind bars." I haven't and used then, that one. I'm going to have to remember uh, that. <laughs> um, I, I want to switch topics. Um, are, are you guys considered boomers or are, are millennials? Millennials, yeah. Are you guys both a millennial? Yeah. So I think you're you're like well within I'm the millennial. I'm, I'm more of like, I, so I'm kind of a foot in both camps. I'm like that 83, <laughs> you know, 1983. I'm, we consider ourselves the zennial generation. I, I want to ask if this is, um, you know, you don't know if this is real or just your perception, but my gosh, you know, I graduated May 11th in Kansas City. I got my car. I drove straight to Phoenix and signed my lease, had it open September 21. Mm -hmm. I see your generation, they come out, they get a job here for a year, and then they hate it and they go get a job here for a year. Mm -hmm. And then in five years, they've had five different jobs and, and they're never happy until they finally just go open up their own practice. Right. And I tell these people, I say, you know, when, cause we got two dental schools here. We got Midwestern in Glendale and we got an AT still right up the street in uh, Mesa. And I tell these people, I said, well, if your idea is so great, well, it's 2020, go back to 2015, get a list of all the graduates, and they should all be working for someone else happily ever after and just loving it. Because I know my homies. And when you go to school eight years of college, you're not gonna agree with anybody the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you want to have a bunch of people agree with you, hire a bunch of 18 year olds or high school dropouts, but no dentist works for another dentist and says, oh yeah, I agree with everything he does. Right. And so, so why, why do they 
job hop, job hop, job hop until they're so you usually they usually they don't open up their practice. They say, you know, I'm so miserable. I hate dentistry so bad. At this point, I don't care if a dump truck runs over me. So I'm just going to open up my own office. And I'm like, I told you that five years ago. Um, do you think your generation, do you think my generation, if we're going to learn how to swim, just walked out of the swim pool and dove in? Of course not. And your generation walked around the pool more, reading more books about swimming before it jumped in? Or, or do you think that's it's a, the same delay? That's a really good question. I think that... Um, uh, it's, I think a lot of that, I'd like to think it has to do with external factors as well. Um, I think that the dental market has more or less, um, it's not fully matured, but certainly more mature than when you got out. And I, I only know what I've heard from more seasoned docs. I only know what I've read in books, but as I understand it, you know, the, the market was quite different back then. Um, we didn't have the competition that we have today from DSOs, from other, other doctors, uh, it was very traditional to start working in a practice, maybe as an associate, eventually partner in and take over the practice uh, fairly amicably. What we're noticing uh, from the discussions that I see on, on Facebook and just with other people in my generation is that one of the biggest uh, challenges we face with getting our own practice is that there's not a whole lot of room to start up anymore. I mean, areas are fairly saturated uh, but most importantly, the uh, senior docs, they're not selling as much as they used to. Or by the time they're selling, it's 10 years past their expiration date. Um, I know that when I first came out of school, I, I never wanted to start up. You know, my first thing, I, I wanted to buy a practice just like anyone else. I remember I started looking for practices to buy when I was still in residency because I knew that's the way I wanted to go. Um, the practices that I did find just weren't, weren't viable. They were declining practices. They were in areas that I just, I didn't see a lot of growth. I didn't see a lot of potential there. Um, you're basically buying a liability. So uh, the inventory, I think, is a, is a huge factor for us. I think there's a lot of uncertainty about the future of the dental market. I think that that does factor into people's decisions. Like, am I going to, right now is actually a really good time to be selling your practice. Um the, the DSO market has really driven up the prices of these practices right now. And we're looking at uh, practices selling for well above 100% of collections, which didn't used to happen. Well, do I have a surprise for you? <laughs> One of the greatest advantages of being old, besides like diabetes and erectile <laughs> dysfunction and all these other <laughs> things, is that um, I have seen... Um, for economic expansions and contractions. I got out of high school in 1980. That was the worst I'd ever seen ever. Interest rates were 21%, unemployment and, and, and inflation was double digit. That was the worst I've ever seen. I've seen nothing close to that. And then it got better. Then 87, I graduated May 11, and September 21 was Black Monday. The stock market dropped a quarter. And then I saw the longest expansion, 93 to 2000, the Y2K bubble. Um, March of 2000, you know, NASDAQ went from 5,800 to 1,600. Um, and then 10 years ago, Lehman's Day. And um, if, you know, you can't predict the future because the future doesn't exist any more than the past. Right. There's only the present in the universe, right. according to Albert. And um, so, um, but it smells like, what's that Nirvana song? Smells like teen spirit or <laughs> it smell. Right. It's the same smell. And right. when you look at the, public information of the available DSO transactions, their debt is all rated as junk. Mm -hmm. And they're, it's all based on this cheap money where you know the interest rates have been negative 1% for a decade. And, but during a contraction, you have to economic deleverage. So these DSOs, when um, I talk to any DSO, and we, we've had the 100 largest DSO CEOs on, on the show, um, they, they're all the same. They, they're all about 30 offices and 10 are doing great, 10 are okay, and 10 are just dogs taking them under. And during that economic, the next economic contraction, which could be, you, you never know. I mean, it's like no one predicted the fall of the Berlin Wall. No one can predict the next uh, um, Black Monday. But when it happens, there's going to be so many DSO portfolio orthodontic practices. There's going to be so much liquidity on the market because... They don't. They're they're not going to just keep giving them cheap free money, right. and and that's the that's the bottom line of an of an economic cycle. 
you know, you can grow, grow, and grow when your banker just keeps throwing money. We talked about right. that in the beginning with, with right. Theos where, where you know, she probably knew she didn't have the product, but if she got enough money, enough momentum, could cash flow enough scientists, exactly. she'd figure it out at the end. Well, the minute the bank calls your loan and says you're not getting any more free candy, mm -hmm. then you have to sell your assets to stay afloat. So um, I was just lecturing uh, in Scottsdale last week to a bunch of uh, dental practice transition people, and I was so impressed is they all knew that that was not news to any of them. They all, they had more data on that than I did. They know of um, all these DSO models that are, um, you know, like say 10 of them are making money, 10 of them are kind of deal, but 10 of them are almost going to take them under. They're all going to be for sale. So you see the DS, you see the dental transition um, organizations ramping up. They're hiring people right and left. But I was wondering my lead into that is, are there, any orthodontic DSOs out there that you think are um, the the ones that are doing well and making money? And are there any out there where you're like, yeah, that's a dog. That thing's going to be for sale the next downturn. Yeah, you're talking DSOs specifically? Or, or orthodontics. Uh, DS on orthodontics. I'd say, you know, it's, it's hard for me to say which ones are doing poorly. I don't have access to those numbers. I do know... Um, you know, Scott Law, who owns Smile Docs, is growing like crazy right now. And that's an all orthodontist DSO. Um, really, that's the only one that I'm uh, somewhat familiar with. So, but I, you know, I do know just from talking to people. Scott, LAW? Uh, LAW, yeah. LAW with Smile Docs? Smile Docs, yes. And you, you think that's the, the um, probably the best example of one? To my good. knowledge, I, I know that that's one that has been growing a lot. Um, some of my friends have uh, ended up selling their practices to his, and um, these are people that I respect who have had, you know, incredible practices, incredible cultures. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to hear Sp Scott speak and speak to him in person, and he's, um, he's, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with, I think, in the future, specifically in the orthodontic DSO market. And what's incredible about what he's doing is that it is, he, he's, he's running orthodontic offices. You don't see that a lot with, uh, with DSOs. Usually the DSOs are more dentistry um, centric and then the specialists are more peripheral and you bring in a specialist a couple times a month just to get some extra income, use up your overhead. But he is, his practices are all orthodontic specialist offices. So um, to my knowledge, he's doing a, a really good job out there and I, um, I'm curious to watch how they, uh, how they continue to expand. Scott Law mm -hmm. was, uh, oh, there it is, Orthos. Okay. And where's he headquartered out of? It's in Texas. I want to say Parker it's Austin. Parker Heights, Texas. That, that, that could be it. Parker Heights, Texas. Huh. That, that was, uh, that's a new one for me. Thank you for that. Of course. And, um, and then we, we're, I, I can't believe we already went over an hour, uh, but uh, uh, don't worry. I've never stayed on time. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure you got patience. But um, back in dentals, uh, one of one of the things we started this podcast was it's not just what you know it's it's who you know it's networking um i don't know i maybe is he, that even if you want to be an orthodontist maybe that also involves pressing the flesh knowing names but it seems like my homies um the, you know they they got a's in calculus physics geometry they're introverts mm -hmm. i mean i mean i was at creighton university i mean every night you know every night we'd hear the same thing ding the library will be closing in 10 <laughs> minutes. I mean, we were, we're geeks. So how do you get that introvert geek who got an A in calculus, physics, geometry, and is probably the only guy in his city who knows the difference between cosine and tangent uh, <laughs> to actually go press the flesh and have lunch uh, with another dentist? Because I remember when I opened up, you know, these specialists said, you go back and then in the break room, there'd be some cake or something from a cookie. Some right. North. I was like, <laughs> I don't want cake and cookies. I... I, I want, I want to meet you. I, I, and, and, um, I, I want to, um, I want to meet my homie. And it's like, it seems like it was easier for them to like, well, we just want to send a pound cake. We don't actually want you to be able to pick me out of a police lineup. So, <laughs> so how do you coach young introvert scientists to be pressy, fleshy, get out there and run for mayor? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, when he was starting up, I was still in residency. We would, uh, I would come up here and we would go out to dental offices and try to put our faces out there. So that way they know that we're, we're people. We're not just, uh, you know, hiding behind a desk and, um, you know, trying to get people to refer to us. We want to be able to meet our general dentist, to meet our pediatric dentist, all, all the specialists, and to know that we are here. We're, like you said, we're here. We're going to be here for the next 
50 years and uh, you don't have to if you don't have time it's okay we'll come back um, mm -hmm. just to keep on keep on going to not give up uh, mm -hmm. you may not see any results for probably a couple years because yeah. people don't know who you are they're they're busy general dentists are busy I mm -hmm. um, they don't like it when someone just stops by and messes up their schedule so right. I understand and sometimes you try to coordinate with their marketing person to try to set up a lunch try to bring their team lunch and then you know the t dentist may have some time to stop by during the lunch and say hi it's just about uh, consistency to just keep on going and um, trying our best to show our faces right. and uh, and you know show up for their kids um, performances like if you're if you're becoming um better friends to to show that you care and that we're not um we're we're not enemies we're right. we're trying to grow uh this profession together we're trying to make uh the communication between uh dentists and specialists better uh, like now a lot of times we can email these uh referrals or facebook these referrals sometimes like we can get a question answered in five minutes when the patient's still in the chair and that's what makes the patient experience much better too overall. so if they're irish you bring them beer and tea. <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah they don't want lunch they just want jameson um i i noticed um some differences like pediatric dentists like 32 years ago the pediatric dentists were always trying to court the general dentist and then they learned that, no, 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 court the OBGYNs and the pediatricians, you know, court them. And they get, now they, their only focus is on pediatricians, not general dentists. And general dentists are the worst because you wait till that kid's six or seven and then has a bad experience and then it goes shows that PA, they, they don't even want that kid. And um, so where do orthodontists get their most referrals? Is it from pediatric dentists or is it general dentists? I mean, for the whole industry at large. I think that it really, we're seeing a lot of different models right now. I can speak from my own experience. I can speculate on others. Um, I'll say in the very beginning, um, the only patients that I was able to treat were the ones who were friends with my one employee, you know, and I, I remember sitting there thinking, I mean, I'd, I'd knock on the dentist doors, but like Dr. Sun alluded to, they're not going to take a chance on the new guy when there's five other guys who've been around 20 years. You know, it's like they know his work. There's nothing wrong with him. Why would they... What's the, except for pity, you know, what, are, what are they going to do to help? You know, me what's out? Um, really weird is, um, again, I've been out here 32 years and every conversation I've ever had, um, with a dentist about referrals is always comes down to the same thing. This guy was the best endodontist in Tempe. This is the best orthodontist in Ahwatukee. Um, but the patients don't like him mm -hmm. and this guy, you know, he's, some of his root canals are short, some are long, some, <laughs> but, um, um, but like, like in, um, like in, um, Ahwatukee, the orthodontic community is crowded out by these two guys. They're both from Canada who just have more personality than you can do. And it, it's never going to come down to quality. Mm -hmm. It comes down to mom come back saying, Oh, I love him. He's so sweet. Right. And this one ended on us who, um, I love him. He's one of my friends. He's the best, but my God, I don't think anybody likes him. <laughs> I mean, he would do ape colectomies and then schedule when the, the have the suture come out, send him to my office, have me do it. I said, <laughs> why, why the hell am I doing your suture yeah. removal? And he, he's just that kind of a freak. And, um, but, um, so it's just the, um, the patients don't know what an MO or DO is and they, they never right. remember what you said. They just remember how you made them feel. And if you um, um, talk down to them and get them to secrete acetylcholine and epinephrine and norepinephrine, they hate you and they never come back. Right. And if you make them secrete dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin, they just love you. And and I and I would say that um, to you homies out there, I, I know you, man. You're 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 an introvert geek, um, and that's why you always you know when when they're hiring a receptionist, they hire the first person that reminds them of the librarian. At dental school <laughs> and you can just walk in an office and smell the 750,000 collections or less because you just walk in there and it smells like a library sounds like a library you're in a library mm -hmm. and man you can smell the million dollar plus practices in one instant because you walk in there and you just feel something instantly and then you see these consultants going in there and they're they're writing scripts to your receptionist of what to say, dude. When you have to write a script on how to talk to another human, yeah. let's just find another human. Right. I mean, you know, I know, 
Um, you know, I mean, I got Valerie answer at the front desk. She could talk to a tree for <laughs> two hours. And um, it's, it's, it's tough because we're, you know, we, we, we master the millimeters, mm -hmm. but our customers don't, don't even know what a millimeter is. I mean, in America, you only know metric if you sell drugs, uh, grams, <laughs> uh, kilos, you know, right. but n no one cares about metric. No one cares about millimeters. They just know, I like you. Yes. And if I like you, and, and you hear it with the deals, they'll say, oh, you should go to my doctor. They never said they were board certified. You guys are both right. board certified. Yes, I am. I, I've never heard of a person, just a simple question, oh, you should use my doctor. Well, is he board certified? Do you know where he went to school? Has he ever had a license taken away? Has he ever served time in Florence? Right. They don't know anything about him. Often the they ones who ask those they questions, like they're not the patients that you want anyway because they're, they're going to make your lives miserable into those little kind of details. Usually well, there's let's, something. Well, let's end on. end on that question. Why did you go through the board certified? What, what, what does that mean to you? Cause that was a lot of work. Of course. Well, I think that, you know, board certification is definitely a, a topic that comes up a lot on, on the forums. It comes up, it, you know, is it a differentiator? Is it, um, you know, is it just an intrinsic sort of value for you? And um, I'll, I'll say first, I don't see it especially as a differentiator. Maybe in some markets, maybe with some people, they like to see that. I mean, I, we, we, I keep the plaque on the wall and, you know, one out of a hundred consults will like make mention of it. Oh, that's, that's cool. Usually they don't know what it means. They're just as, they're just as blown away by the diplomas. Um, I think that within the orthodontic profession, you, it's rare that you'll find someone nowadays who truly tries to use that as a differentiator. I think a lot of that has been debunked at this point. The value that I see in the uh, board certification is more about the process to get there. Uh, I was lucky enough to finish my cases in residency. So for me, it was like, uh, I mean, I, I actually even questioned, should I go take this exam or not? You know, because it's still 2000 bucks. It's time away from the clinic. And, you know, I, you have no money when you graduate and it's a, a huge expense to fly to St. Louis and show your cases. And, you know, it's, and you have to study for it. It's another exam. I thought I was done with all this stuff, you know, but it came down to, you know, I have my exam and, you know, I, I'm, I'm in for a penny, in for a pound. I want to go as far as I can with this. So I go out there and take it. And the, the process of just restudying all those cases that I had completed in residency or even just identifying which cases are going to qualify for a board exam, then reviewing all the material again and presenting it in front of people who will pick your cases apart. They will make you feel like the worst orthodontist ever. And, and that's when you still pass the exam. But the point is you learn to look for the minutia of those details and you get a new perspective on the, uh, on what you're missing more. I mean, you can have great cases without that, but how do you know that they're great cases? And I think that there's nothing that you get in the board certification process that you can't get from self-study, but not all of us will take that time to study in that level of detail or seek out the kind of mentors that will pick apart your cases to that level of detail. And to me, I think that's the, the biggest value of the, of the certification process. Of course, it's a source of intrinsic pride for me, but it's, um, it's really, it was really the learning experience that I, that I got the most value out of. When you got your board certification, did she start calling you chief again? <laughs> oh man, I tried. Don't I, give cannot, any ideas. I cannot get her to do that, <laughs> man. Oh my gosh. Just once on air. Can you call me chief? Oh my God. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Um, la, la, last thing, I just want to part one thing. First of all, thank you so much for coming on your thank busy you so days and coming down here. Of course. But the one thing about, I know about my homies is that, um, you're doing this big Facebook group. Mm -hmm. So when you, um, and Ed Zuckerberg, who's, you know, fathered Mark, who owns Facebook, he can tell you 90% of people on, on social media platforms of every kind, they just lurk only 10 per only 1% so true. or original content. Nine will engage 90% will say nothing, but that's for the whole Facebook in the world and Twitter right. and LinkedIn, all this stuff. But I'm just talking about dentists. Cause that, that's my, um, that's my home turf. Um, when you have dentists on your Facebook group, um, nine out of 10 are going to say nothing. And when you have your mother of pearls conference, uh, they're all going to be in classroom style, mm -hmm. but they, but, um, MTS Manji, you know, Scottsdale center. We, we, he's come on the show and talked about this many times, but you have to be under seven or nine at a table before they'll do like this board certification where they'll pull out their cases, engage and show you their worst nightmare. Right. But, um, MTS says, um, cause, cause, um, Scottsdale center, uh, is actually, it's 
they, they have more study clubs that people people always think about the center, but their real strength is the number of study clubs they have around. And MTS says, you know, um, they all they just crush it at seven and under, particularly five. So if you guys are ever setting up study clubs for orthodontists, or say you want to have general dentists who want to learn more about Invisalign or something like that, um, when you get it to a table like this, I'll pull out my study models and show you the root canal that I perfed and. Uh, got a perch that went out their nose and the patient almost died. <laughs> but once it's seven or nine, they once at about seven to nine, they clam up, they go into classroom style and they're on Facebook and they're just taking it all in, but they're never going to show their cards. Yeah. So in the flesh, press the flesh. That's why, um, that's why, um, you know, um, press the flesh, go, go to lunch with them one-on-one. -on -one. And, and, that's why I like the reps because the reps that I use, it's not whether Benko Burkhardt or whatever that the reps I use is because she's the one to say, Hey, Thursday at this bar, you know, three of us are going to go out there and, and I'll, I'll just go for the beer. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, they're, they're relaxed or loosen up and it's all the connections. Like the implant I use is from the implant rep who can get the most people together right. in, in these right. small intimate seven dentists or because if you went to the bar and there were 20 dentists in the room well then now you're on facebook again yep but you go to that bar and there's only four people or five people you'll you'll open up totally. but on that note thank you so thank much you so much yeah. for coming on the show it's been it was a pleasure an honor to thank podcast you. you both chief uh, <laughs> finally All right. I'll call you some chief recognition <laughs>